हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट एंड यू वाचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा We begin with West Asia. No peace deal in sight between Israel and Hamas, but a new war is on the horizon between Israel and Hezbollah. There was a rocket attack on Saturday that killed 12 children. Israel has vowed retaliation, plus Turkey has threatened to join the fighting. So will the war spread? Does Netanyahu have the appetite and the wherewithal to handle a wider war? We'll discuss all of that. Meanwhile, Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni is in China. She met Xi Jinping today. We we'll tell you what she's up to. Why Maldivian President Mohammad Muizu is saying thank you to India. It's a classic U-turn. Why Prime Minister Modi is planning a visit to Ukraine weeks after he went to Moscow. Jay Shankar says Quad is not a talk shop. We'll talk about the many deals, drills, and alliances that have been formed against China and what they've achieved so far. How sexism is rampant in sports, even in the Olympics, being hailed for gender parity. the many controversies in the paris games what maduro's win means for venezuela and why the opposition has rejected the election result how nigeria is bracing for protests and a special report on world tiger day all of this and more coming up the headlines first russian president vladimir putin issues a nuclear warning threatens to restart production of mid-range nuclear weapons if the us deploys missiles in germany putin says the move is reminiscent of the cold war washington plans to start deploying long range missiles in germany from 2026 eight people stabbed in a knife attack in northern england the injured include children a male suspect has been arrested the attack took place near liverpool uk prime minister keir starmer has condemned the incident Protests resume in Bangladesh it comes after the Hasina government ignored an ultimatum to release the student leaders the stir against job quotas has led to deadly clashes in the country more than 200 people have been killed in the protests so far US President Joe Biden unveils plans to overhaul the Supreme Court he wants term limits for the justices who currently serve for life it's a long shot move since Biden has only 6 months left in office the current Supreme Court is packed with Trump appointed judges Turkey approves a controversial move to cull some of its stray dogs its parliament backs a bill to euthanize sick or aggressive stray dogs the government says this will prevent dog attacks and the spread of rabies there are around 4 million stray dogs in Turkey And Novak Djokovic crushes Rafael Nadal in the Olympics, beats him in straight sets. The tennis legends met for the 60th and possibly the final time. Djokovic and Nadal are the two most successful male players in tennis history. It's a question we have asked before. Is the Gaza war spreading? We've seen false alarms in the past few months, but this one could be real. Israel and Hezbollah are inching closer to war. And the trigger, what happened on Saturday, a tragedy unfolded in Golan Heights. It's a rocky plateau in southwestern Syria. Israel captured it during the 1967 war. and now they control this region the golan heights on saturday a city in golan heights was attacked not a military site not an industrial facility but a football ground it was a saturday so children were playing there and 12 of them were killed by rockets let me repeat that 12 children killed by a rocket strike while playing football their funeral was held on sunday thousands of residents gathered to pay their respects Allah 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 Allah
Do we know who did it? Israel is blaming the Hezbollah in Lebanon, but the group has denied responsibility. They say we did strike Golan Heights, but we did not strike the football field. It's a hard sell, though. Many military experts have investigated the rockets. They say they look similar to the ones fired from Lebanon and Syria, which is why Israel is plotting revenge. Their top defense officials visited the attack site and promised to make Hezbollah pay. Hezbollah, Iran's proxy in the region, Hezbollah will not be exonerated for this event, even with its absurd denials. They fired, they will bear the price, and they will pay a heavy price for their actions. The only question is how? How will Israel make Hezbollah pay? They've already unleashed drone strikes, dozens of targets in southern Lebanon have been taken out, but the worry is Israel may not stop there. You see, this attack has united Israel's politicians. They have differences on Gaza, but they agree on this one, that Hezbollah must be taught a lesson. Of course, some have suggested radical measures. The finance minister wants the Hezbollah chief's head. The national security advisor is calling for war, and one opposition MP said, tear Beirut apart. So you get the sentiment in Israel. But the final decision will be Benjamin Netanyahu. The cabinet has given him a free hand in this. He can decide what Israel's response will be. Will it be a full-blown war or will it be a targeted strike? The world is preparing for both. Some airlines are cancelling flights to and from Beirut. Air France and Lufthansa have done it. So have some Turkish carriers. Countries are also issuing safety advisories. Germany is asking its people to leave Lebanon. The US is asking citizens to reconsider travel. And India is asking its people to exercise caution. Clearly, they all fear an attack. And it is a real possibility. Israel and Hezbollah have been exchanging fire since October last year. Hezbollah has killed 22 Israelis. And Israel has killed 350 Hezbollah fighters. But these have been targeted attacks. Could it explode now into a full-blown war? Netanyahu's far-right allies would love it, maybe the prime minister as well, because it would extend his time in office. But the rest of the world, not at all. You see, Hezbollah is not like Hamas. They're said to have 100,000 fighters, 150,000 rockets and missiles, plus battle experience. So if a war breaks out, it won't be a walkover for Israel, not like Gaza. Also, their allies are not on board. The United States, for instance, says it does not want to see an escalation. We're in conversations with the government of Israel. Um, and again, I emphasize its right to uh, defend its citizens and our determination to uh, make sure that they're able to do that. But uh, we also don't want to see the conflict escalate. We don't want to see it spread. The army won't be thrilled either. Top generals want a post-war plan for Gaza, but Netanyahu won't spell it out. So Israel is basically winging the Gaza operation. In that context, are they ready to take on Hezbollah, to open a second front? It's a very risky idea because the Gaza front is still evolving. Some new players now want to get involved. I'm talking about Turkey. President Erdogan is hinting at direct military intervention. Listen to this. We need to be very strong so that Israel cannot do these ridiculous things to Palestine. Just as we entered Karabakh, just as we entered Libya, we can do something similar to them. There is no reason for us not to. Erdogan is talking about putting Turkish soldiers in Gaza. I know the first reaction, that's just Erdogan being Erdogan. But Turkey is NATO's second biggest military. It has a history of operations in Syria, in Iraq, and in Libya. So can you really ignore this threat? Well, Israel isn't. Their foreign minister has hit back at Erdogan. He has compared him to Saddam Hussein. So the worry is real. Israel could end up caught in a multi-front war. Let me pull up the map for you to explain. The south is already a war front. If Turkey enters, it could get even worse. To the north, you have Hezbollah, a formidable fighting force. And don't forget the fighters in Syria. They are funded and armed by Iran. 
If need be, they can join the fight as well. And finally, you have the Houthis in Yemen. They're already firing rockets at Israel. If this war spills over, expect them to jump in. So Israel could end up fighting on four different fronts. Of course, the U.S. cannot stand by and watch that. So Washington may get involved if it comes to that. And as a response, Iran may get involved, which is why the next few days are going to be very crucial. All eyes will be on Netanyahu, much like it's been since October 7th. He hasn't shown restraint in these 296 days. Let's see if he starts now. Now let's talk about Giorgia Maloney, the Italian Prime Minister. She's in China this week trying to pull off a tough balancing act. It's an awkward trip for Maloney. Last year, she pulled Italy out of the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, Xi Jinping's flagship project. Under her, Italy dumped it. But now Rome is having a rethink about its relationship with Beijing. Maloney says she wants to quote-unquote relaunch ties. Listen to this. I am very pleased to be here for my first official trip to China since the beginning of my government. This is a clear demonstration of the will to begin a new phase, to relaunch our bilateral cooperation. In that spirit, Giorgia Maloney met China's top leader, starting with Chinese Premier Li Qiang. This meeting took place yesterday. They signed three, a three-year action plan covering several areas like trade, investment, education, food, security and environment. Italy and China want to boost collaboration on all these fronts. And today, Giorgia Maloney met Xi Jinping, the Chinese president. The Italian prime minister struck a conciliatory tone. She called China, and I'm quoting again, an important interlocutor on the world stage. And Xi Jinping reciprocated. He hailed China's relationship with Italy. <laughs> China and Italy should uphold the spirit of the long history of the Silk Road and view and develop bilateral relations from a historical perspective, a strategic height, and a long-term perspective, so as to promote the international community to seek common ground and expand consensus. Maloney and Xi said all the right things. The optics were well managed, but they could not paper over the tensions, especially on the trade front. The Chinese premier spoke about this. He said China has, is ready to open up to Italy, but they want something in return. China's door of opening up will always be open to companies from Italy and other countries. At the same time, we hope the Italian side will work with China to provide a more fair, just and non-discriminatory business environment for Chinese companies doing business in Italy. What is he referring to? Maloney's policies, her attempts to check China's growing economic influence. Premier Li could be hinting at some recent events. The first one involves Pirelli. It's a major tire manufacturer. This company sells tires in more than 160 countries. Pirelli tires are also used in motorsport competitions like Formula One, so it is a, quite a famous brand. It is also a brand which is synonymous with Italy. Pirelli has been around for more than 150 years. But today, its biggest shareholder is a Chinese company, China's state-owned chemical giant, Sinochem. Sinochem owns a 37% stake in Pirelli. Earlier this year, Sinochem tried to take control of the company. But Rome blocked this move, citing national security concerns. The Italian government ensured that Pirelli's control remained in Italian hands. That's Marco Tronchetti Provera. He's a top executive of Pirelli. The Maloney government gave some clear orders. They said only Provera and his private investment company, Campfin, can appoint the CEO of Pirelli. Now, Campfin is the second largest shareholder in this tire maker. It owns around 22% of the shares. So thanks to the government order, Pirelli still remains in Italian hands. Obviously, this did not sit well with the Chinese. 
And this is just one sticking point. Italy also backs Brussels on Chinese EV tariffs. The European Union wants to restrict the import of Chinese cars and especially Chinese electric vehicles. And to do so, they've hiked import duties on Chinese EVs. So some car makers now face up to 37% in extra taxes, 37% extra tax if they import an electric car from China to Europe. Again, Beijing does not like it, so it is pushing back and retaliating. I'll tell you how. China is investigating European imports. It's targeting European imports, European products that are imported by China, like pork, cognac, and high-end cars. So there's a tug of war between Europe and China, and Georgia Maloney is on the European side. Italy has voted in favor of higher taxes on Chinese cars. What does all of this tell you? That Georgia Maloney knows where to draw the line. She has been a vocal critic of China where it matters. Her track record is also consistent. In 2008, Maloney was a junior minister in the Silvio Berlusconi government. She was a youth minister, and in that capacity, she had urged Italian athletes to boycott the opening ceremony of the 2008 Olympic Games. To boycott it over China's human rights record, particularly in Tibet. Because in 2008, Beijing had hosted the Games. And now, as Prime Minister in 2024, Maloney is pushing back against Chinese dumping, while also looking to tap Chinese investment to boost growth at home. It is what we called it in the beginning, a tough balancing act. Our next story is from the Maldives. Slowly but steadily, the Maldivian government is changing its tune. Up till a few months ago, they had an anti-India stance. But now it looks like they're trying to shed that image and adopt a friendlier tone. The Maldivian president, Mohamed Moizu, gave a speech on Friday to commemorate his country's Independence Day. During this speech, he did something quite unexpected. He thanked India. Moizu expressed his quote-unquote sincere gratitude for India's support to the Maldives and for helping ease their debt repayment burden. And that's not all. Moizu said that he was negotiating a free trade agreement with India, also a currency swap agreement. So the Maldivian government wants to expand trade ties with India and that too in local currencies. This is a complete U-turn for Muizu. He came to power last year on a very different plank. He led what was called an India Out campaign. Some Indian military personnel were stationed in the Maldives to help with maritime rescue and relief operations. Muizu called them a threat to Maldivian sovereignty. He pushed for their ouster. That was the crux of his India Out campaign. And this campaign won him the presidency. Indo-Maldivian ties have been strained ever since, thanks to a number of Maldivian diplomatic blunders. First, they went after the Indian troops, all of whom have left the Maldives now. They've been replaced by Indian civilians, so not exactly India out, but Indian troops out. The unnecessary drama over this led to diplomatic tensions. It also halted rescue and relief efforts, which only resumed on Friday. So Moizu caused a diplomatic row and inconvenienced his own people for months. That was the first blunder. Perhaps he could have escaped it unscathed, had it not been for some of his vitriolic ministers, who were clearly taking a cue from him. They targeted the Indian Prime Minister. At the beginning of this year, Prime Minister Modi was in Lakshadweep an Indian territory in the Arabian Sea, quite close to the Maldives. Modi was there to promote the islands as a tourism hotspot, but some Maldivian ministers did not like it. They decided to insult the Indian Prime Minister. They abused him on social media, and this sparked outrage in India. Moizu disciplined those ministers eventually, but the damage had been done by then. A boycott Maldives campaign started in India. A large number of Indians cancelled their trips to the nation, to Maldives. And remember, this is a tourism-dependent country. So the economic fallout was significant for them. The Maldivian economy was already in a precarious position because of the Wuhan virus pandemic and the resultant crash in global tourism. They were just recovering thanks to Indian tourists who were flocking to the Maldives. But Moizu's ministers ruined it. And the boycott from Indians hit them where it hurt the most, their coffers. In fact, it's one of the reasons why the Maldives is in dire need of debt relief. Because tourism, its main money maker, is still in a slump. 
And while the Indian people are still angry, the Indian government seems to have forgiven Muizu. Or at the very least, New Delhi is being pragmatic. Muizu was invited to Prime Minister Modi's swearing-in ceremony last month. It was a show of goodwill. More importantly, India agreed to roll over some debt on a $50 million loan. Repayment was extended by one year. That's a rollover of the loan. And the Maldives needed it very much. They're facing a mounting debt burden. Their annual repayments are only going up way more than the country can handle. So the debt relief from India is welcome. But it's only a short-term solution. Eventually, the Maldives needs to earn more money to pay back its massive debt. And that means only one thing, more Indian tourists. Their tourism minister is in India this week to woo Indians. He's launching a promotion drive called Welcome India. Road shows will be held in Delhi, Mumbai and Bengaluru to try and persuade Indians to visit the Maldives again. Clearly, Muizu has come a long way from India out to Welcome India. It's a textbook example of a U-turn. It's the ultimate juggling act. On July 8th, Prime Minister Modi was in Moscow. He was sharing hugs with Vladimir Putin. 20 days later, there is talk of Modi visiting Ukraine. The date doing the rounds is August 23rd. That's when Prime Minister Modi could go to Ukraine. Now, this is very important. For starters, it's a wartime visit. So the logistics are more complicated than usual. You can't just fly into Kiev. Prime Minister Modi will have to travel to Poland first. From there, he will have to catch a train to Kiev. That's how all world leaders have visited the city. Secondly, the timing. This month, Modi was holding talks with Putin. Next month, he'll be holding talks with Volodymyr Zelensky. It's quite a turnaround. And finally, it's a long-awaited trip. Ukraine became independent in 1991 when the Soviet Union disintegrated. That's when Ukraine became a separate country. And since then, no Indian prime minister has visited the country, not one in 33 years. So Prime Minister Modi could be the first. I guess the only question is why now? The West wasn't happy about the Prime Minister's trip to Moscow, especially the US and Ukraine. Zelensky called it disappointing. He accused Modi of hugging a war criminal. But India brushed it aside. New Delhi said every country can set its own policy. So here's the question. Is this trip about damage control or is it about a balancing act? In the last two years, India's policy has consistently evolved. At first, it was mostly by the book. Support for the United Nations Charter, call for diplomacy and no condemnation of Russia. That was India's top position. But in two years, a few things have changed. Number one, Prime Minister Modi told Putin that this was not a time for war, which made one thing clear. India is not supporting this invasion. The policy is not anti-Ukraine, it is pro-India. Some countries have understood that, but some are yet to accept it. And change number two, the focus on human cost. We saw the Prime Minister do that in Moscow. Listen to what he said. You the whole संघर्ष हो आतंकवादी हमले हो मानवता में विश्वास करना वाला हर व्यक्ति जब जानहानि होती है तो बहुत पीड़ित होता है लेकिन उसमें भी जब मासूम बच्चों की कत्ल होती है मासूम बच्चों को मरते हुए देखते हैं तब हृदय छलनी हो जाता है और वो दर्द बहुत भयानक होता है एन इमोशनल अपील दैट टू इज अ सटल चेंज इन इंडिया पोजिशन बट वॉट लेट टू दिस ऑलमोस्ट थर्टी थाउजेंड सिविलियंस एव डाइड इन दिस वॉर आई एम श्योर दैट मूव द नीडल बट सो डिट स्ट्रैटेजी India has a growing relationship with Western countries. At the same time, Russia has a growing relationship with India's rival China. 
So New Delhi wanted a balancing act. Modi has spoken to Zelensky five times. He's also met him twice since the war broke out. Both meetings were during G7 summits. Having said that, he also has some red lines. Zelensky wanted to attend last year's G7 summit in New Delhi, but India did not invite him. Zelensky also requested Prime Minister Modi to attend the peace summit in Switzerland, but Modi did not go. He sent a delegation instead. So what should we expect if Modi visits Kiev? I guess more of the same. There won't be a condemnation of Russia. There won't be political support for Ukraine. But there will be symbolism. Prime Minister Modi represents 1.4 billion Indians. He's taking all that goodwill to Kiev. Beyond that, it will be tough. Very few world leaders have visited both Kiev and Moscow since the war broke out. Indonesian President Joko Widodo is one of them. So is Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa and Viktor Orban of Hungary. None of them made breakthroughs. Let's see if Prime Minister Modi has better luck. Let's now talk about the Indo-Pacific. In recent months, China has increased its military pressure on various targets in the region, from Taiwan to the Philippines in the South China Sea to Japan in the East China Sea. There have been numerous meetings and summits. The U.S. and Japan have held talks with the Philippines. American lawmakers have traveled to Taiwan. The G7 has condemned Chinese aggression, all in a bid to contain Beijing. Today, Quad foreign ministers gathered in Tokyo. They vowed to keep the Indo-Pacific free and open. India's External Affairs Minister S.J. Shankar was also present. He said, Quad is not a talk shop. It can deliver practical outcomes. Our next report tells you what all these efforts, these alliances, deals, drills and meetings have delivered so far. Diplomatic meetings are often a dull affair. They typically follow a set pattern. Leaders greet each other with a handshake, flash polite smiles for the cameras, then disappear behind closed doors for talks. More often than not, that's where the show ends for the press. If there is an agreement, journalists get a statement in their inboxes. Otherwise, the details remain shrouded in secrecy, much like a secretive talk shop. The Quad, a group of the United States, Australia, Japan and India in particular, often faces this stereotype. But this year was different. Foreign ministers of the Quad met in Tokyo today. They wanted to make a statement. This is not a talk shop, but a platform that generates practical outcomes. That was S. Jay Shankar, India's external affairs minister. Jay Shankar, along with his Quad counterparts, tried to make all the right noises. They called out the Chinese aggression in the South China Sea. Beijing was labelled the greatest strategic challenge in the region. The Quad made a pledge as well. They planned to bolster maritime security in the Indo-Pacific. But China was quick to downplay these declarations. The Quad consisting of the US, Japan, India and Australia have claimed to build a free and open Indo-Pacific, but what they have done was creating tension intentionally, inciting confrontation and containing the development of other countries, which completely goes against the trend in Asia-Pacific of seeking peace, development, cooperation and prosperity. This won't gain support for sure. No one doubts the need for alliances like the Quad. They can be an effective counterforce in an increasingly volatile Indo-Pacific. But so far, China remains undeterred by them. Case in point, Taiwan. Taipei is hosting a large gathering of lawmakers this week. They have invited representatives from 35 countries. Politicians from Bolivia, Colombia, Slovakia, North Macedonia and Bosnia have also been invited. China is pressuring these lawmakers, trying to stop them from going to Taipei. And that's not all. In the East China Sea, China is challenging Japan. Earlier this year, the Chinese Coast Guard docked its ships in the region. They spent at least 158 days in the contested area, the longest recorded presence of Chinese ships. Tokyo is now seeking a more effective deterrent against China. Japan has turned to its biggest military ally, the United States. The United States will upgrade the U.S. Force, forces Japan to a joint force headquarters with expanded missions and operational responsibilities. Now, this will be the most significant change to U.S. forces Japan since its creation. 
and one of the strongest improvements in our military ties with Japan in 70 years. The U.S. and Japan are planning a new joint command. The details are still being finalized. But the plan is to grant greater operational authority to the U.S. forces stationed in Japan. Please have a seat. Japan hosts over 50,000 American troops, but they currently take their orders from the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command in Hawaii. The goal is to counter Chinese aggression by projecting a united military front. Other regional powers in the Indo-Pacific also dealing with the belligerent China will be closely watching as America and Japan's actions could set a precedent for other regional alliances to follow. The Paris Olympics is on right now. I'm sure you've been catching the action. They say swimming is very competitive this time, so let's play a little game. Imagine, it's day two of the games. You're watching a men's swimming event on TV. Meanwhile, a medal ceremony is also underway for the women's 4x100 freestyle relay. Suddenly, you hear this. Well, the women just finishing off. You know what women are like. Hang it around, you know, do the makeup. In case you missed that, let me repeat. This is what the commentator said, and I'm quoting. Well, the women just finishing up. You know what women are like, hanging around, doing their makeup. Just a casual dose of sexism. And not even the original kind. We must have heard the makeup joke a million times by now. It wasn't funny the first time. It's not funny centuries later. But that's Olympics commentary for you. The man you heard is Bob Ballard. He was doing commentary for Eurosport. And he's not some rookie. In fact, he's quite the veteran. He's been covering world events since the 1980s. Eurosport has removed him from the team. He's also released a statement. Let me quote what he said. The comments I made during the Australian freestyle relay victory ceremony of Saturday have caused some offence. It was never my intention to upset or belittle anyone. And if I did, I apologise. Guess what's missing from this statement? An admission of guilt. This commentator is refusing to say that he was wrong. Instead, he's shifting blame to the audience. And that sums up the problem. We know there is sexism in sports. But sexism also exists in sports coverage. Bob Ballard is a clear example of that, but he is not alone. Look at the 2016 Games. US swimmer Katie Ledecky was billed the female Michael Phelps. As if that comparison were, was a holy grail. Another example is Katinka Hosu, again a swimmer. She pulled off a record-breaking swim in 2016. The cameras panned to her husband and coach. And guess what the commentator said? He called the husband the man responsible for the feat. He wasn't even in the water, but who cares? A third example is Simone Biles, one of the greatest Olympians in history. In 2016, she put up a stunning display on the uneven bars. And guess what the commentator said? I think she might even go higher than the men. Again, as if that was her target. To be compared to male competitors. All of this points to a systemic problem with sports coverage. In fact, the Cambridge Press did a study. They looked at a massive database of sports material, things like articles and social media posts. Look at the most common words that are used for women. Aged, older, pregnant, married and unmarried. Now look at the words that are used for men. Fastest, strong, big and great. Do you see the difference here? Men are judged and described based on their performance, but women are not. Often they are treated as eye candy. Let me show you this message from the Olympic broadcaster to cameramen. Avoid sexist camera coverage. What does that mean? More close-ups than necessary or weird camera angles. You will only see this in the women's draw. In the men's, it's all about the action. Things are so bad that cameramen are being asked to not sexualize female athletes. It's frankly disappointing. This Olympics was supposed to be a game changer. For the first time, half of all athletes are women, meaning that there is gender parity. But clearly that's not enough. We need to root out sexism in coverage as well. The question is how? Strict punishment is an obvious answer. But as Bob Ballard showed, it's not enough to teach the lesson. 
What we need is more women in the coverage too. Only 20% of sports journalists are women. Same with camera work. You may keep hearing about camera men, but you will rarely hear about camera women. So what we need is a systemic change in attitude and in representation. If not, true gender parity will not be achieved in sports or anywhere for that matter. So sexism is rampant at the Olympics, but that's not all. The games are known for embarrassing gaffes and looks like Paris is off to a bad start too. Since the games opened, here's what the host has done. Wrongly introduced South Korea as North Korea, played the Sudanese anthem in a South Sudan game, hoisted the Olympic flag upside down and even placed the Olympic rings wrong. This is the world's biggest sporting event, and these blunders do not bode well for Paris. So what are the organizers saying about them? Can Paris avoid more such slip-ups? Our next report tells you. The South Korean team was excited. Its 143 athletes were waving their flags, floating down the Seine, waiting for their introduction. But it did not go as expected. The announcers did welcome them, but as the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. That's not the name of South Korea. Ironically, it's the official name of North Korea. It was an embarrassing gaffe, and South Korea did not take it well. They launched a strong complaint. They called for a meeting with the Olympic Committee president. After all, who would like to be introduced as their warring neighbor? Never the Olympic Committee has since apologized, but it wasn't the only faux pas. Looks like Paris is having a hard time getting names and countries right. Look at what happened with South Sudan. It is gunning for Olympic glory, but that run took a nasty turn on Sunday. The men's basketball team was gearing up for the games. They stood for the national anthem, but the organizers played the Sudanese anthem instead of that of South Sudan. It was met with boos from spectators. Soon, they realized their mistake. The right anthem was then played, but it wasn't a good look for Paris. The organizers called it a human error. But South Sudan did not let it go easily. The team called it disrespectful. After all, it is the Olympics we're talking about. But Paris is no stranger to controversy. It started right with the opening ceremony, especially this sequence. It was a banquet scene showing drag artists. Many felt it was a parody of the Last Supper painting by Leonardo da Vinci. The famous artwork itself represents a key scene from the Bible. This was signed off on. Signed off on this. And so it did not go down well with the Catholic Church in France. They called it a mockery of Christianity. And the reason they're doing this, everyone at home... But the outrage wasn't just limited to France. Soon it was all over social media. Conservative politicians, far-right groups and Christian communities slammed the event. It forced the organizers and creative director to apologize. And clearly there was never uh, an intention uh, to, to show disrespect to uh, any uh, religious group. Uh, on the contrary, uh, I think that Thomas Jolie really tried to uh, really intend to, to celebrate community tolerance. That was uh, his word yesterday. And uh, looking at the result of the polls that we shared, uh, we believe that this ambition was, uh, was achieved. If people uh, have taken any offense, uh, we are, of course, really, really sorry. Our intention was never to be impertinent or to be subversive, as I said earlier. Our idea was simply that with this great diversity, we wanted to collectively include everyone. The list of blunders goes on. During the ceremony, the Olympic flag was raised upside down. The five colored rings of the iconic emblem were also in the wrong positions at one point. Looks like the Olympics are off to a tumultuous start and Paris has a lot to answer for. After all, this is the biggest sporting event in the world. It must ensure there's no more faux pas. Failure to do so will only undermine the games.
Now let's look at Venezuela, a South American country that is home to the world's largest known oil reserves. Venezuela was once a Spanish colony. In the last century, it has seen political and economic turmoil. In the last decade, it has seen hyperinflation, shortages, joblessness and crime. Yesterday, Venezuela held its presidential election. The results are in and the country's fate is not expected to change just yet. The incumbent president, Nicolas Maduro, has won again. I can say in front of the people of Venezuela and the world, I'm President Nicolas Maduro Mora, re-elected president of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, and I will defend our democracy, our law, and our people. Maduro has been the president of Venezuela since 2013. He was once a bus driver who became a union boss, then joined Venezuela's ruling party. Maduro worked his way up. He was parliament speaker in 2005, foreign minister in 2006, and then vice president in 2012. In 2013, Maduro finally became president, and since then, he has overseen a period of economic decline. Venezuela's economy shrunk by more than 70% between 2012 and 2020, so a 70% fall in eight years. About 7.7 .7 million Venezuelans fled the country for better opportunities elsewhere. But despite this record, Maduro has apparently won the election with more than 51% of the vote. His main rival got 44%. This is what Venezuela's Electoral Council has declared. There's one small problem, though. The Venezuelan opposition has rejected the result. What happened during today's polling day was a violation of all the rules, to the point that the majority of electoral registers have still not been handed over. Our struggle continues, and we won't rest until the will of the people of Venezuela is respected. That was Maduro's main rival, Edmundo Gonzalez. He's a former Venezuelan diplomat, and he was thrust into the limelight by chance. You see, most other opposition candidates were disqualified for one reason or the other. Gonzalez was the only one to escape the purge. So the entire opposition decided to back him, and they say they will keep backing him. Edmundo Gonzalez Urrutia got 70% of the votes in this election, and Nicolas Maduro received 30% of the votes. This is the truth and my dear Venezuelans, this is the Venezuelan election with the largest margin of victory in history. Congratulations Edmundo. That victory speech may sound nice, but will it change anything? As of right now, Maduro is still in charge. He's the ba he has the backing of Venezuela's electoral commission, the nation's army and every other lever of power. If he says he won, who can prove him wrong? A number of countries tried to oust him in the past. After the 2018 election, Maduro's victory was disputed back then as well, in 2018. And the country's parliament appointed someone else as interim president. They appointed this man, Juan Guaido. About 60 countries chose to recognize Guaido as the Venezuelan president. Only about 20 supported Maduro. But in the end, it was Maduro who reigned. It looks like the world hasn't learned the lesson, though. Most countries have called the election into question. They're calling for the votes to be verified. Most of them do not trust Venezuela's electoral body and believe that it committed fraud to hand Maduro the victory. Only a handful of countries have congratulated Maduro. From Latin America, you have Cuba and Bolivia. And then you have China and Russia. These are the same countries that backed Maduro in 2018, and they will continue to support his regime. China and Russia are United Nations Security Council members. They can veto UN moves to oust Maduro. So it won't be easy to get the Venezuelan president to step down, and Venezuelan citizens know this. So they seem to be resigning themselves to six more years of Maduro. Triste. I am sad because we lost hope for a better Venezuela. For better or for worse, Maduro will remain in power, and unless the world engages with him, the people of Venezuela will continue to suffer.
Now let's look at Nigeria. The country is bracing for protests. There are three days to go. Thousands are expected to take to the streets on Thursday, on August 1st. The protest is against a number of issues like inflation, which has crossed 34%. It's at a 28-year high, 34% inflation. There's a cost of living crisis in Nigeria, rising poverty, hunger and unemployment. People are facing a number of problems and they've decided to voice their frustrations on August 1st. The protests will last for at least 10 days, at least that's the plan. They're being organized online using the hashtag end bad governance. Some of the protesters have been inspired by similar demonstrations elsewhere in countries like Kenya and Uganda. Nigerians are also taking inspiration from their own protests, like the end SARS protest in 2020. But this time, there doesn't seem to be a clear goal in mind. This is like an umbrella protest against everything going wrong and the people responsible for the mess. In other words, Nigeria's government under President Bola Tinubu. The powers that be are afraid. They're doing everything to dissuade the protesters. We told you what happened last week, how Nigeria's police and army issued warnings and how the government decided to raise the minimum wage. But those measures did not work. The protests were not called off. So the government decided to roll out more incentives. On Friday, they advertised job vacancies at the Nigerian National Petroleum Company. This is the state-run oil company. It announced vacancies on the social media platform X after nearly a decade. You can imagine how excited some job seekers were, especially considering Nigeria's economic situation. There was so much traffic that the oil company's website crashed. So that was one move to stop the protests. Nigeria has also revived a youth investment fund. It will disburse about $70 million to young entrepreneurs. So those were some more carrots. But the government is also using the stick. It cannot ban the protests outright, so it's trying to make things difficult by asking prospective protesters to register themselves with the police. All the groups who want to protest need to submit some information like the details of the group leaders, their planned protest routes, their assembly points, expected duration of the protest, and the measures that they're taking to prevent bad actors from hijacking the protest. That is a lot of paperwork. And it seems the onus of stopping goons has been shifted. The government's goal is quite clear here, to exhaust the protesters even before they begin. The Nigerian government is pulling out all the stops. Officials from every rung of the government have called for calm. They want the people to give the government more time. Religious groups have also been pressed into action. Some even met President Bola Tinubu, and then they began opposing the protests. The result is this. Nigeria is even more divided. Most protesters want to demonstrate peacefully, but there are also many who do not want to join them because they fear the negative consequences like possible looting, destruction of public property, violence and police brutality. The Nigerian government has been highlighting all these risks. So what will be the result on August 1st? Will the protests manage to stay peaceful or will anarchy be unleashed? We'll be tracking this for you. For our last story tonight, let's talk about the tiger, an apex predator that has roared its way into our collective imagination. Tigers have long left a mark on culture, literature and movies. 29 July is celebrated every year as World Tiger Day. The majestic beast once freely roamed the world, but that's not the case anymore. In the last century, 97% of the tiger population has been wiped out. By the 1970s, their numbers had dwindled to an all-time low. It prompted a global outcry for their protection. Countries like India have since introduced conservation efforts and the results have been impressive. The tiger population has gone up, but the animal is still endangered. Our next report tells you why it is important to protect the tiger. Tiger, tiger burning bright in the forests of the night. It's how William Blake starts his famous poem, The Tiger. Blake questions how God could have created something as ferocious as the tiger alongside vulnerable creatures like the lamb. The poem essentially explores religious paradigms. But the focus is on the tiger, especially how it's a miracle of nature. 
Blake wasn't the only one who was inspired by the tiger's fearful symmetry. From time immemorial, tigers have been cast in the role of the noble savage. Majestic, untamed and yet misunderstood. From myths to legends to traditions and even folklore, tigers are revered as symbols of power, protection and bravery. Indian gods are depicted on them. Indian tribes believe in tiger deities. Some regard the tiger as their protector. And it's no different across Asia. Chinese folklore often portrays the tiger as a guardian against evil spirits. Tiger temples are a common feature across Vietnam. Nepal holds a tiger festival where devotees dress like the animal. The tiger god is an important deity in Taiwan. Japan considers the tiger sacred. Thailand has a culture of worshipping the animal. So tigers are revered across Asia. But the West has a different relationship with the beast. They are a source of fascination across pop culture. Take movies, for example. In the world of animation, tigers are both heroes and villains. There's Kung Fu Panda's Honorable Tigress or the quintessential villain, Sher Khan. And then there's everybody's favourite, Tigger from Winnie the Pooh. Modern cinema and literature have taken a slightly different route, exploring the complex relationship between humans and tigers. Like the life of Pi, there's a Bengal tiger stranded on a boat with the protagonist, and when these animals aren't portrayed as scary, tigers make for good mascots too. There's Tony the Tiger, featuring on millions of boxes of Kellogg's Frosted Flakes. Or even Shera, it was the mascot of the 2010 Commonwealth Games in India. So why does the tiger resonate with us so deeply? Maybe it's the embodiment of untamed beauty and raw power. But that hasn't stopped us from wiping out most of the tiger population. In the last 100 years, 97% of the global tiger population has been lost. Right now, only about 5,574 tigers remain in the wild. Around a century ago, 100,000 wild tigers roamed across Asia. Now there's only 4%, which is why countries are racing to save these majestic beasts. First is India. It's home to 80% of the world's tiger population. The tiger is the country's national animal. So it's leading the charge with its project Tiger. And the numbers have only gone up in the last decade. China and Thailand too are contributing to conservation efforts, with the numbers rising in both countries as well. But despite these recent efforts, the battle to save the tiger is far from over. Habitat loss, poaching and human encroachment continue to pose huge challenges. This prowling cat may have clawed its way into our hearts, books and screens, but it's important to ensure that its stripes never fade from the wild. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. At least 140 people injured in southern Russia after a train crashes into a truck. NASA astronauts celebrate the opening of the Olympics from the International Space Station and thousands of firefighters battle the raging park fire in northern California. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1958, NASA was created in the United States. NASA stands for National Aeronautics and Space Administration. It was created in response to the Soviet Union's first satellite launch. NASA is responsible for coordinating America's activities in space. We're leaving you on that note. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.
the International Space Station. We've had an absolute blast pretending to be Olympic athletes. We, of course, have had the benefit of weightlessness. We can't imagine how hard this must be to be such a world-class athlete doing your sports under actual gravity. So from all of us aboard the International Space Station to every single athlete in the Olympic Games, Go Godspeed! Across continents, one powerful news source. Bringing you diverse perspectives on the issues that matter. We go beyond the boundaries to give you that little extra about every sporting moment. So thank you for making First Post 5 million strong. We're counting on your support, and you can trust us to bring you the news unfiltered and unvarnished. Climate change is on our doorstep. It's time for a revolution to take root. And it starts with 1.4 billion Indians. It starts with one tree. One tree for humanity. One tree for Mother Earth. One tree for our future. Project One Tree, a News 18 Network initiative.